Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's November 4th. Today, we celebrate the man who's remembered in the Botany Building at the University of Glasgow. We'll also learn about the mystery behind the California fan palm. And we'll salute the folklore of November, along with a witty poem about November by an American poet and satirist. We grow that garden library with a book about some incredible private gardens in the San Francisco Bay Area. And then we'll wrap things up with a charming 1855 journal entry from an American writer. Don't forget, if you want to subscribe to the podcast, you can do so on Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeart, or any of your favorite podcast hosts. And to listen to the show while you're at home, all you have to do is ask Alexa or Google to play the latest episode of the Daily Gardener podcast. It's just that easy. Just a reminder, if you'd like to send out some gardener greetings, they'll start up next week. You can go ahead and send your garden pictures, stories, birthday wishes, and so forth to me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. And finally, if you'd like to check out any of my curated news articles or blog posts for yourself, you're in luck because I share all of it with the listener community in the Facebook group for the show. And it's totally free to join. It's the Daily Gardener community. So there's never any need to take notes or search for links from any episode. The next time you're on Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener community and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the English botanist and primitive plant expert, Frederick Orpen Bauer, who was born on this day, November 4th, 1855. Bauer served as the Regis Chair of Botany at the University of Glasgow. When he arrived in 1885, the department was housed in just two rooms, and the herbarium was stuffed into a small attic space. To make matters worse, when Bauer lectured, he had to vie for a lecture hall with other departments and faculty. Fifteen years later, the university finally constructed a brand new botany building, and when it was finished, the building served as England's first botanical institute. The 1901 grand opening for the Glasgow Botany Building was lumped in with the university's 450th anniversary celebration. The eminent botanist Sir Joseph Hooker opened the building. Almost a century later, the building was renamed to honor Frederick Orpen Bauer, and that's how the building became known as the Bauer Building. Tragically, on October 24, 2001, the Bauer Building was significantly damaged by a fire. The losses included first editions of Darwin's Origin of the Species and Hooker and Bauer's works. Many of the oldest botanical manuscripts and books were impacted because they were stored on the third floor under the roof space. After almost four years of continuous work, the building reopened in November 2005. The 2001 Bauer Building Fire is a cautionary lesson for archivists and curators to digitally preserve our most precious historical artifacts before they are lost to time. And it was on this day, November 4th, 1984, that the Arizona Republic newspaper shared an article about the history of the native palm of Arizona, written by Vic Miller, a professor of agriculture at Arizona State University. The article starts this way, Yes, we do have a native palm. Seeds of it were collected in Arizona, taken to Belgium, and grown in a nursery, where it was observed and named by a German botanist, but it is not called the Arizona fan palm. It is called the California fan palm. 
The mystery of the California fan palm was not about how it got its name, but rather where it came from, California or Arizona. In 1976, researchers made a discovery that helped solve the 100-year-old mystery. Here's the fascinating backstory. In 1879, a German botanist named Hermann von Venland saw the palms growing in a Belgium nursery. He named the palm Washingtonia filifera in honor of George Washington. The name seemed appropriate since Vinland only knew that the seeds for the palm had been collected in America, but he had no idea which state was home to the palm. Three years earlier, in 1876, the German botanist Georg Drude had noted that the seed was collected in Arizona along the Colorado River. An Italian botanist, Dr. Francesco Franceschi, also said that the palms were from Arizona. But a Stanford botanist named Samuel Parrish disagreed. Parrish knew that the area where the seeds were supposedly collected was near Prescott. And according to Parrish, this was a region of pines rather than palms. To Parrish, the seeds had to come from California. But what Parrish didn't realize is that there were small groves of Arizona palms, roughly 38 miles from Prescott, near Castle Creek. So now the researchers wondered how the Arizona palm seeds ended up in Belgium. Well, It turns out the 1870s stagecoach line went right along Castle Creek to Prescott, Arizona, and then on to Santa Fe, New Mexico. In September 1872, the Czech botanist and extreme orchid hunter Benedict Rezel was in that part of the Southwest on his way to Mexico. Rezel likely bought some of the ripe purple fruit from those Castle Creek, Arizona palms, and then he sent the fruit back to Germany with his other specimens. And that is how the Arizona fan palm was named the California fan palm by a German botanist who saw them growing in Belgium. In today's Unearthed Words, we're going to hear a collection of November folklore. Here goes. Thunder in November, a fertile year to come. A heavy November snow will last till April. Flowers in bloom late in autumn indicate a bad winter. In which case, we're in trouble up here at the cabin, I guess. Here's one. If there's ice in November that will bear a duck, there'll be nothing after but sludge and muck. If trees show buds in November, the winter will last until May. Two left. There's no better month in the year to cut wood than November. And finally, ice in November brings mud in December. A lot of sayings about ice. And here's a little poem about November from the American poet, writer, critic, and satirist Dorothy Parker. In May, my heart was breaking, oh, wide the wound and deep, and bitter it beat at waking and sore it split in sleep. And when it came November, I sought my heart and sighed. Poor thing, do you remember? What heart was that? It cried. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Private Gardens of the Bay Area by Susan Lowry and Nancy Berner. The marvelous landscape photographer, Marion Brenner, took all the photos. And together, this team toured over 35 private gardens in the San Francisco Bay Area.
Now, whether you're from this part of the country or not, you will surely be seduced by the enchanting beauty of Northern California. It's a dreamscape for landscape designers and gardeners. Susan and Nancy organize their book geographically. We get to follow along as they make their way from the San Francisco Peninsula to San Francisco into Berkeley and Oakland, and then wrapping up in Napa, Sonoma, and Marin. And you'll gain appreciation for so much about this area, the microclimates, the range of plants, the drought-tolerant natives, the rock gardens, and the endless supply of gorgeous backdrops. The tour includes the 1911 Masterpiece Garden, known as Green Gables, the Salvia Haven, known as Big Swing, love that one, a jaw-dropping vertical garden in San Francisco, and many more. Susan and Nancy reveal the goals of each gardener and the design secrets behind every garden. This book is 256 pages of garden ideas. Susan and Nancy's coffee table book would be a fine gift for an avid California gardener or anyone who would enjoy touring this horticultural paradise vicariously. You can get a copy of Private Gardens of the Bay Area by Susan Lowry and Nancy Berner and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $35. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. It was on this day, November 4th, 1855, that Henry David Thoreau wrote in his journal, The winter is approaching. The birds are almost all gone. The note of the DDD sounds now more distinct, prophetic of winter, as I go amid the wild apples on Noshituck. The autumnal dandelion, sheltered by this apple tree trunk, is drooping and half-closed and shows but half its yellow this dark, late, wet day in the fall. Larches are now quite yellow in the midst of their fall. When I look away to the woods, the oaks have a dull, dark red now, without brightness, The willow tops on causeways have a pale, bleached, silvery, or wool grass-like look. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Bierbaum, Kiana Raley, Maddie Doyle, Natalie Decker, and Eric Begay. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Instagram and listeners always have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. All the stories Stories and books that are featured on the show can be found over at thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Last but not least, you can share your own gardener greetings on the show by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.